So tonight, I just want to talk a little bit about one of our newest programs for the society, and I'm just going to take a few minutes before Scott comes up. Um, you know, late last year, we had a donor who gave us an extremely generous donation to the society to fund for approximately 10 years a program called the Traditional Technologies Program. And towards the end of that, we'll be looking forward to raising more money to continue that program. But the donation that we have right now will last for about 10 years. And it's really focused on traditional technologies and Native Americans. And so this inaugural uh, study trip, which I just got back about 12.30 this morning from, uh, was in Oaxaca. And we took uh, four uh, Zuni, Hopi, Santa Clara, Comanche, and uh, Tiwa uh, artisans, artists in traditional technologies, folks that are weavers, folks that are basket makers, folks that are uh, feather rug makers, and a variety of other traditional technologies like that, uh, along with scholars in traditional technologies, um, a wildlife biologist who's also a traditional technology scholar, several archaeologists, uh, and ethno historians to Oaxaca for a week to do an intercultural exchange with uh, five different language groups in Oaxaca who do traditional technologies, either basket making, pottery, or uh, textile making. So I just want to talk a little bit about that for a few minutes. It was a, just an amazing trip. Uh, so in this first photograph, in case you don't recognize it, that's a backstrap loom, something that's uh, relatively unique. It's principally just found in Mesoamerica, although I found out on this trip by one of the uh, artists who was on the trip, uh, uh, Chris Lewis, who's Zuni. Uh, in back until about the 1890s, the Zuni also used backstrap looms, which I had not known, which was kind of interesting and exciting. But just, uh, you know, the objectives of the program essentially are to contribute to the preservation and revitalization of Southwest traditional technologies um, to organize and facilitate educational trips, especially for underserved and underprivileged communities such as tribal groups, um, to encourage scholarly research into traditional technologies, to encourage the documentation interpretation of cultural information, to provide educational opportunities, and to publish and share those results. Um, and so that's something that we're doing. So this is the map of Oaxaca. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a sec. Oaxaca is in southern Mexico, uh, and it's got a lot of embedded indigenous communities. In a lot of these areas, especially in the highlands, uh, there were no roads in these areas until the 1960s. Uh, and there were massive transformations starting at that time in terms of loss of traditional technologies, loss of cultural knowledge, uh, cultural continuity of traditional ways and so forth. Um, so this was the group. Uh, I'll talk briefly about all of them. Um, but uh, these first four folks, are the, the, the native artists who went on the trip, Akima's uh, from Hopi. He's one of uh, a handful of Hopi weavers. Uh, Mary, who's from Santa Clara Pueblo and is also Comanche. She does, she's the Jill of all trades. Uh, if you actually um, uh, Google her on YouTube uh, for things like sandals, uh, feather, feather uh, rugs, uh, blanket, feather blankets, uh, there's a variety of different videos that come up. She's actually been able to figure out how some of these ancient uh, sandals were made. Uh, Chris Lewis from Zuni, he is literally right now the, uh, the last uh, basket maker at Zuni. Uh, he's trying to continue that tradition, but it's but it's an uphill battle. Uh, and Louis Garcia lives in Albuquerque, and he's Tiwa, and he is a just a Renaissance guy when it comes to weaving. Um, what he's been able to do. Uh, the chair, co-chair Louis Garcia is co-chair of the committee for the, uh, this program, and Lori Webster, who many of you know, she's a U of A PhD. Um, She's the co also co-chair. She's a perishable fiber specialist. Uh, Chuck LaRue is a wildlife biologist, but has worked with a variety of these folks over umpteen years, identifying different elements of these perishable uh, 
uh, perishable fibers in a variety of uh, contexts. Uh, Curly lives in Albuquerque. He's an archaeologist, but he's also, among other things, an ethnohistorian and a filmmaker. He's a documentary, uh, documentary, doc, doc, I can't say the word. Uh, he's a filmmaker. Uh, so he, he actually filmed, uh, he took hours and hours and hours of footage, and uh, he's going to be creating a documentary uh, of, from our trip. Ben Balrado, he's given a talk here, uh, right here on the stage in the past. He's a grad student, studies sandals, American Southwest. Uh, Shelby uh, Tisdale is another U of A PhD. Uh, she's a cultural anthropologist. Uh, Kelly Hayes Gilpin from NAU. Southwest archaeologist who's done a lot of stuff related to textiles as well as rock art, and of course myself representing the board. And then uh, Traditions Mexico is an outfit uh, jointly out of Oregon and, and southern Mexico, uh, started and owned by Eric Midling. Um, they've been around for 20 some odd years. They led the trip. Uh, Eric originally started 30 years ago as a pot purchaser for Jackalope in Albuquerque, did that for about 10 years, and then started this company after that, uh, after making just amazing connections in rural Oaxaca with uh, indigenous groups. So uh, I couldn't imagine what this trip would have been like without him. Um, so this was pretty much the root of our trip. We started in Zapotec territory in the basin of Oaxaca, headed up into the highlands, um, hung out with Highland Mishtec folks, uh, uh, Trike and um, Musco are two different language groups, kind of in the boundary between the highlands, dropping off the Cortilleta into the lowlands, uh, and then the lowland Mishtec is where we ended up. Uh, we spent six days or so traveling around uh, the highlands and lowlands, and during that time we didn't see another gringo. Uh, that was pretty amazing. Um, so we start off in Oaxaca City, you know, very important colonial town. Cortez had a home here after he uh, took over uh, Tenochtitlan in the basin of Mexico. Uh, actually, right down the street on the left was his home. Uh, just beautiful architecture. Uh, we spent uh, two half days uh, visiting Mitla uh, in the valley of uh, uh, in the valley of Oaxaca and also Monte Alban. Um, and then we started driving. Uh, we spent sev uh, several different days going to uh, re uh, regional markets, very colorful. And these regional markets in rural areas really are the life heart of communities. Uh, any kind of traditional technology, whether it's a mano matate or traditional foods, you're going to be finding at these markets. And it's getting more and more difficult to find some of these traditional technologies, such as, for example, yucca rope because it's so much cheaper to buy plastic, right? And the list goes on and on. So um, uh, I was pretty impressed by an entire row of brazers in the middle of the market where people could buy food from a butcher and have it cooked right in front of them. Uh, just, uh, so we started visiting Z uh, Zapotec Weaver. He's been around for a long time. He actually, traditionally women weave on a backstrap loom, um, but here he learned from women. He's one of the last people in this community outside of Mitla uh, to use a backstrap loom, and it was a man, so that was pretty in interesting. He also had a massive, uh, several massive looms as well, uh, more traditional Spanish style looms. They were introduced. Uh, we learned on the trip a lot about natural dyes, including uh, cochineal, the bug that we all know from our backyard uh, prickly pears. Uh, this cochineal, uh, I think the last time the Valley of Oaxaca exported cochineal was probably in the 1920s. Um, people still use it today in rural areas, but he purchases his from Peru because it's easier. Um, this is um, a traditional brown dye that's made from uh, a certain kind of tree bark. Um, called Sopilote, literally a uh, vulture tree. Um, and this is uh, something that we learned about. There's 13 people in the, in the country of uh, Mexico that have a permit to collect uh, the, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of dye that comes off a particular kind of seashell called a purpura shell. And it produces this purple dye 
it's a lost art. Uh, 50, 100 years ago, there'd be tens of people coming down from one particular uh, town in the highlands, hiking a week down to the rocky coast, spend a month collecting these seashells, tapping them to get their a dye out of them, to dye their, their skeins of cotton, uh, then put the shells back so they'll continue to grow. Um, and then they go back with massive amounts of skeins of, of cotton. Today, you know, just even 15, 20 years ago, a person in a month could, could um, color 50 skeins of cotton. And today that same person can do about three. So uh, it's, it's a lost start principally because of overfishing and loss of, uh, you know, traditional area. Um, so this really was a lost start, but uh, the, uh, this person here named Rafa, he took us and we went down and we spent part of a day watching him collect this, uh, this dye, which was just incredible. Um, we spent a lot of time doing intercultural exchanges. Uh, on the one side is Ben Ballarado sitting with uh, a, Mish, uh, a Southern Mishtec woman learning about um, using the spindle whorl with uh, traditional brown cotton. And then on the other side, we have uh, several folks from the group, including two tribal members, watching someone working the backstrap loom, doing a really intricate design. Um, a number of the uh, uh, Southwest native artists brought examples of their own weaving and so here's one example of uh, one of these Mishtek women showing off uh, what Louis Garcia had made and brought to share. Um, and on the other side is Akima showing one of his examples um, to another Mishtek woman. Louis Garcia here on the, on the uh, your left, he actually grew some brown cotton a couple of years ago and recreated a Hokam uh, textile that hasn't been made in a thousand years. And he's showing that <laughs> to this uh, Mishtek woman. So that was, that was pretty incredible. And then here's Akima. He's from Hopi. He actually wove this uh, traditional Hopi style dress, uh, showed it to the, to the ladies in the group who were just so impressed. And he ended up trading it for some Mishtek uh, weavings, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, lots and lots of uh, opportunities to learn more about traditional technology with weaving from these uh, various groups, um, and this was actually really example, a uh, really interesting example. A lot of traditional folks in Oaxaca don't card cotton because they don't have that technology. The cards themselves in the United States cost about $100. That's way outside their means. So they do something that's been used for thousands of years, and using sticks to beat cotton to get their uh, fibers aligned and stretch out the cotton and soften it is something that we find, these sticks we find in archeological context uh, in uh, rock shelters and stuff. Lori Webster, for example, has found those in a number of the collections that she's been studying uh, that were collected back in the 1880s, 1890s. So this is a technology that you know, carries over like a lot of other stuff between the American Southwest and, and uh, Mesoamerica. And you can just see in just a few minutes how much longer that, uh, that bundle of cotton got. By the end, uh, something that starts off maybe a meter wide uh, ends up being about five meters wide. They call it a snake when they're done. Um, and so these are just, we got put to work one day uh, picking seeds out of uh, traditional brown cotton. You can see in the middle uh, the end result of that. And these are on the other side is a slide of four examples of different kinds of traditional cotton that's still grown today that's been grown for thousands of years two different types of brown cotton, a white cotton, and uh, kind of a grayish green cotton. Um, and in a lot of these communities, that cotton has disappeared and only recently is being brought back uh, due to the very hard work of a few individuals and communities that are interested in continuing these kinds of traditional technologies. And so in some cases, they're going to other communities and talking to the elders, to uh, the, the abuelas, the, the grandmothers to see if they have seeds they can use to start growing cotton again. Um, and finally, we ate a lot. Uh, we ate wonderful food everywhere. We, had, uh, we were visiting traditional communities. They would serve us lunch. <clears throat> They're cooking on traditional kamals over an open fire. 
uh, one special day, the last day we were in one of these villages, they served us a meal that was uh, extremely unusual, only served on very auspicious times, and it included mussel uh, tamal. So literally a tamal with shelled mussels in it. It was just, just an amazing uh, uh, meal. And so the next steps for this program uh, in this coming year, over the next six months, everyone, you know, there were six folks from the group who were fully funded to go on this trip. Everyone else uh, paid their own way, including the entire committee. And um, those folks uh, that, that were participants over the next six months are going to be doing a number of programs in their own communities. If they're tribal members, they're gonna be giving a series of talks in their own tribal communities about this, thinking about traditional technologies, how to expand new ideas, and so forth. Uh, and other folks in the group like Curly, who's the filmmaker, he's gonna be creating a documentary. Um, I'm not quite sure how long that's gonna be at this point, um, but <clears throat> we're expecting He'll be making several versions of it, including one that's got Spanish subtitles, so we can send it back down to these communities. If they're traditional Mishtek or some of these other native languages, they may not even speak English. So we may be looking into also hiring a Mishtek uh, who's a native Mishtek speaker uh, to do an overvoice uh, of the documentary as well. We'll see how that works. Um, but we're also hoping sometime in the fall to bring back some of the native artists and some of the other folks from the trip uh, to come here to a meeting uh, like this. We'll show the documentary and we'll do a, a roundtable discussion uh, with all of you about those experiences and outcomes and everything else. Um, I can't express uh, how enriching it was to be on this trip as part of it and I think everyone uh, gained a lot from being on it. So it's, it's wonderful that we got this anonymous gift. I think it really says a lot about the society that someone would give a substantial amount of money and uh, it'll have good outcomes. So thank you.